I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar, Basic Income, The Experience So Far, and I'm so pleased to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, so our host uh, is Tom, and Tom for the, the past nine years has been the director of the Ham Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction, uh, which is a collaborative organization formed to tackle the city's unacceptable levels of poverty. Throughout the work of the Roundtable, Tom has engaged governments at all levels to invest in poverty reduction initiatives and work to give people um, experience, experiencing poverty a voice in the decisions that affect their lives. So he's advocated for social assistance rates that reflect the real cost of living, fought to end predatory lending in Ontario, and helped to co-found the Ontario Living Wage Network. Um, more recently, Tom was involved in helping to establish Ontario's first basic income pilot, a critical research project testing whether uh, providing basic income would stabilize housing, improve health, and enhance social inclusion opportunities for low-income individuals. Um, Tom is actually going. Tom has helped us put together this great panel and is actually going to lead the session today for today. So, Tom, I'm going to hand it over to you now to introduce the rest of the panel. Thanks, Natasha. It's great to be here today. I am going to turn off my webcam, though. Uh, I'm having a little bit of uh, delay on the Wi-Fi, so hopefully that will uh, make the experience a little bit easier to hear. Um, so I'm just turning it off, uh, but it's my pleasure to introduce um, three absolutely phenomenal advocates for basic income. Uh, first, Evelyn Forger. Dr. Evelyn Forger is an economist and professor in community health sciences at the University of Manitoba. She's best known for her work on basic income, which includes a reanalysis of the Mincome basic income experiment. Uh, Evelyn has published widely and often advises governments, international bodies, and First Nations on health policy. Her most recent book, uh, and I'd highly recommend it, is Basic Income for Canadians, The Key to a Healthier, Happier, and More Secure Life for All. Also, I'd like to introduce Sheila Regeer. Sheila is a founding member of the Basic Income Canada Network and is chairperson since 2014. She's also a former executive director of the National Council of Welfare, an independent advisory body to the federal government that published comparative reports on Canada's provincial and territorial social assistance systems, comprehensive poverty profiles, and analytic reports focused on solutions. And finally, last but not least, James Kalura. James is a former UBI participant. He's an aspiring artist, an entrepreneur, and a McMaster University economics graduate. He's fascinated by and well-versed on the effects that technology and information are having on the job markets and how they are changing the way people derive a sense of meaning and purpose in life. So welcome to Evelyn, Sheila, and James, and thanks so much for joining us today in these early days of summer. Um, we have, uh, have a lot to get through this afternoon uh, within an hour, so I'm going to jump right into the questions. So this is really the, the first of three sessions on basic income we're going to be holding over the summer. And we're going to be looking at uh, basic income from a, from a high level today. Uh, in future sessions on July 22nd, we're going to be talking specifically about the Ontario Basic Income Pilot Project, talking to some of the evaluators and participants. And in the last session on August 12th, we'll be looking at the future of basic income and how you can advocate uh, in your own communities uh, for our basic income. Uh, but for day, today, I'd, I'd love to hear from, uh, from Sheila, Evelyn, and James about their ideas and, and why basic income captured their attention. So maybe I'll start with you. Was there a pivotal moment that made you realize I need to get behind this idea of basic income? Sorry, Tom, you dropped there for a second. Was that for me? <laughs> yes, it was, Sheila. Okay. So, I mean, my short answer is I think everything in my life has somehow led to this point. Um, a lot of what I did in my professional work with the federal government um, was looking at gender equality. And within that, a lot of my work focused on the measurement and policy implications of non market work. So, everything that gets done in the household and in the voluntary sector. And that, I think, naturally 
you know, leads to an understanding of, you know, there have to be ways other than just the distribution of jobs to help people get income. So I worked on areas like tax policy. Um, as you mentioned, the work that I did at the National Council of Welfare, I think more than anything highlighted the failure of most of the solutions that we've got to, to really find any, you know, lasting means of eliminating poverty. So I think my whole life led to this in a way, but the pivotal point, I think, was when a few of us, including Hugh Siegel, who was a senator at the time, kind of hooked up with some Americans and discovered this North American basic income network. And as I went to some of those meetings and listened to people talking about what they thought a basic income was, I realized that Canada, with its seniors and kids benefits, was sort of way ahead of the game in a lot of practical ways and that we really had a lot to offer. So that resulted in the creation of the Basic Income Canada Network. Great. Thanks, Sheila. That's, uh, that's really interesting. And, and Evelyn, we know, we know a lot about your history in researching Mincom. Uh, was it slow progression for you or was there an aha moment when you said, this is something I really need to get behind? I think it was a slow progression. I mean, I, I was always sympathetic to the idea of a basic income. Um, I first heard about the Mincom Project when I was an undergraduate many, many years ago, when the project was, in fact, being undertaken in Manitoba. So I knew about the project for a long time, but it was really just slightly over 10 years ago. I was working in the Health Sciences Centre in Winnipeg as a health economist. And when you're a health economist in Canada, there's only ever one question that people keep asking you over and over and over again, and that is, how, how are we going to continue to run the healthcare system? How are we going to pay for this? And it became very obvious very quickly that we were investing a lot of money after the fact, trying to mop up the consequences of poverty and economic insecurity. We had a lot of people um, living with inadequate programs, programs that didn't really meet their needs. And um, we were spending a lot of money very inefficiently trying to deal with people whose chronic conditions had gotten worse, people who'd lived for years in really bad housing and taken really bad jobs for a number of years and paying for the costs of that through the healthcare system. And over time, it just became it just became almost inevitable to ask the question of whether we could invest the money up front and get some better outcomes, invest the money in families and in people and give them the opportunity to make decisions that led to better outcomes. Great, thank you very much, Evelyn. We'll get a little bit deeper into some of those issues during this conversation. Uh, I have a question for Sheila. Uh, so uh, basic income has different meanings for different people. And we saw a bit of that in, in James's video. It's supported by many on the left as well as many on the right of the political spectrum. So from anti-poverty advocates like me who want to reduce societal inequality to, to business leaders. And we saw uh, pictures of uh, Elon Musk on the video who believe basic income can save capitalism. And, and, and there are currently pilots going on in, in California. Uh, uh, United States presidential candidate Andrew Yang is, is proposing a citizen's dividend of $1,000 a month. And um, here in Ontario, our, our recently ended pilot project um, was, was $17,000 annually. So my question, Sheila, is, is there a magic figure or formula of what a basic income needs to be to be both effective for people as well as for communities and affordable to taxpayers? I know it's a big question, but wondering if we can uh, <laughs> tackle that one. Actually, Tom, I think there's 20 questions in here. <laughs> At least many things for us to discuss. So I'm going to start backwards and start with sort of the last bit and, and then work backwards. And uh, I mean, this really is big. So if I'm talking too long, somebody just cut me off. So on the affordability question, um, I mean, the answer is yes. We're a wealthy country. There are many wealthy countries. So that, that to me is not a question. It's a matter of priorities. We have to decide what we want to do, what kind of a society we want. We have to decide if we can afford the costs of poverty that we're currently experiencing in healthcare, as Evelyn mentioned, in crime, in social cohesion that's falling apart. We see more and more disruption and unrest politically uh, and in the streets. Um, we have to decide if we can afford to let 
corporations hide their money. We have to decide whether we can continue to be one of the only countries on the planet that doesn't have wealth and inheritance tax, or if we let the wealthy keep their tax breaks that they really don't need. So yes, we can afford it, no question about that. The magic figure question is interesting. So you, you mentioned a couple of things, and this gets complicated too. It, it's going to be different in different countries. So let's start with your Stockton example. They're providing $500 a month to people. Um, is that a full basic income and is it going to get them out of poverty and do everything we want? No. But given the alternative, which in the United States is very often food stamps, like you get access to no money at all very often. Um, so obviously compared to the alternative, it's an improvement. Is Andrew Yang's $1,000 a month enough in the United States where public education is falling apart, where access to health care depends so much on your income and your employment? I don't know. In Canada, and generally within countries, what you want to look at are like things that we know and can measure. We have measures of low income. We have measures that tell us whether people are meeting basic needs or not like measures of food insecurity, uh, measures of health status, and things like that. So, you know, there are logical benchmarks, and that's what Ontario used. Um, you know, they didn't go for the full low-income measure, but, you know, having something close was what they used to design the amount. Um, so, and that amount is kind of equivalent to what we provide for seniors as well. So, you know, there's some sense in that um, based on our history. Um, the, the magic formula thing is something else that I find interesting. What we have done in Canada very practically is use a negative income tax model. And there are some, and I won't go into the whole description of that now. We can, we can do that in the questions if you want. Some people are saying that that's not really a UBI where everybody is supposed to get their $1,000 or whatever a month. But this system works and it works for Canada and it works for us because we've already got a lot of these programs built in and we've got a tax system that will enable us to do it where in other countries it, it doesn't. So, Finding the, way, the right way of doing things really is a matter of analyzing what your situation is and making sure that your basic income is what you want. So on BICN's website, you'll see a document called The Basic Income We Want, and it talks about complementing public services, money isn't everything, and all of those left-right issues that you talked about. And then I want to go back to what what James talked about too very quickly and your idea of saving capitalism. There are others who think a basic income is going to save us from capitalism. So there's some varying ideas on that too. But one of the interesting ones is coming from Silicon Valley where they're talking about basic income as a need in order for people to be able to keep consuming all the things that the robots are able to produce. And for that, your basic income is going to have to be a little bit bigger than just meeting what we conceive of as basic needs for food and shelter and that sort of things. It might be the median income, for example, if, if people are going to be able to consume. And that higher level might actually allow people to consume better and more ecologically, for example. So th there's a lot in there. Um, so uh, I believe Tom was going to ask that um, one of the arguments against basic income is that it may be used as an alternative to higher minimum wages, um, implementation of national farm care or national child care programs. Um, but does it need to be so? Is basic income at this or at that proposition, or is there room for basic income to sit side by side with other progressive expanding social policies? Um, well, I, th I think building on what Sheila said, I think most people in Canada who argue about the introduction of basic income see it as a supplement to other kinds of social programs that already exist. The important thing I think to remember is that basic income is just money. It's, it's just a way of redistributing income and getting income into the hands of people who need it. 
Um, there are lots of other things that we need that are better supplied directly and healthcare, public education are good examples of that. So I, I don't see pharmacare as an alternative to basic income or basic income as an alternative to pharmacare. We know that a, a government run pharmacare program can provide those goods and services much more efficiently than the market can. So there's a good reason to have those provided directly. On the other hand, what basic income can do is to get hands and in, uh, get money into the hands of people um, much more efficiently than our existing suite of programs like provincial income assistance or um, even employment insurance, many of the other programs that already exist um, to supplement um, people's living standards. So I don't think it's an either or proposition. You mentioned minimum wages. Um, raising minimum wages is a very important thing for, for low wage, low income working people. Um, but many of the people who are working minimum wage jobs don't necessarily live in poor families. Many poor families have nobody working at minimum wage. So it's not necessarily the most efficient anti-poverty program. There's a very good reason to support higher minimum wages, but that has to do with social justice, making sure that people receive adequate wages for the work they do. If you want to address issues of poverty, I think basic income is a much more direct way of doing that to ensure that people actually have the income they require to, um, to meet their needs. Uh, Jane, your experience uh, with basic income is more recent. Um, and I know we will actually be talking to some of the other pilot participants um, about some of the specific outcomes of the Ontario pilot uh, later in this month. Um, but what did receiving a basic income enable you to do that you couldn't do before? I think one of the biggest parts for me was um, the psychological shift that happened as soon as I was given um, a UBI. It was as though I was given the mental freedom to start considering and looking at, okay, what, what do I really want to do with my life? What, what do I, where do I want to be? How do I want to feel when I'm at work? Uh, you know, I, I was working for money, for an income, for financial stability when I was at the bank, but by no means would I call it, uh, you know, fulfilling or, or a job that I really enjoyed or one that made me particularly happy. Um, the moment I got UBI, I realized, you know, oh, you know, I can find work that's going to increase my happiness, my well-being. Uh, it's going to be something that I'm really better suited for. Uh, and that's something that I ended up doing when I did get UBI. I, I was never unemployed. I switched right from the bank to working at the current place I work at now. And the whole industry is uh, based around mindfulness and health and wellness. And, uh, you know, I have a meditation room right next to my front desk. I'm sitting in it right now. Um, and it just feels a heck of a lot better. I got a lot more creative. I started doing a lot more art. I started taking time um, working on entrepreneurial ventures, which before, when you're thinking about trading your time for dollars, it's almost like there's there's this scarcity mindset. It's like, do I want to spend time doing that if it's not going to pay me? Um, but when I was provided for by, you know, by society, when society was giving me something and, and you know, I was taken care of, um, at least my basic needs were, um, you know, my natural way of thinking is like, okay, how can I give back? What do I want to do? How can I contribute? Um, and, you know, really, uh, I like listening to philosophers. One of my favorite philosophers is a guy named Alan Watts. And one of his famous questions is, you know, what would you like to do if money were no object? What would you really enjoy doing? Some, you know, what would you enjoy spending your life doing? Um, and, you know, I think for a lot of people that ends up being some creative endeavor, some helpful endeavor, uh, some, you know, being of service to others. I really think that's what naturally happens. Um, I think that's a natural tendency for humans. And I think um, there's something about people who don't believe in UBI and don't believe in, in the good that it will do. It's also not believing in a certain aspect of our humanity that I really think is, is going to come through and is going to shine through when we start making people feel safe and secure and, you know, having, you know, rather than that scarcity mindset, really having people have that psychological freedom to say, what is it that I really want to do? And that's like Andrew Yang talks about, it's going to unlock a human potential that we haven't been seeing. There's so many people that give their time and their energy to something just to trade it off for a paycheck. And when it goes beyond that, and it's really, you know, rather than finding meaning in a menial task, which is what, you know, it's proposed that we were supposed to do, uh, you know, in history, 
I think we're going to be finding meaning in, in new ways. Um, and I've seen it happen with other UBI participants. And I think it's that's going to be the natural progression of UBI. So, so that's what it really did for me was um, there's a mental shift that I, I think a lot of us are going to be able to experience in the future once something like this is implemented. Okay. Uh, Sheila, there are a couple of schools of thought about implementing basic income. So some want to see decisive government action and full implementation of the basic income for all Canadians. And you touched a little bit on this in your previous answer. Um, but others see uh, a more practical in incremental approach, uh, gaining public support and showing uh, that basic income is fiscally responsible. Can you? Uh, Talk to us a little bit about how basic income is slowly evolving within Canadian social policy uh, through programs we already have in place. Sure. So this is one of the things that was my real trigger moment when I thought Canada really needs to be part of the International Basic Income Network. When we talk about incremental types of policy, we have to realize that Canada's already halfway there in many respects. Oops, grandchild. Um, so we have a fully developed basic income for seniors. So it's an unconditional income. It's provided by a combination of a demigrant and a negative income tax type of model that ensures that basic needs are met if you're 65 or older. We have also moved a long way to using tax credits for families with children. So you have to understand that the money is based on the number of ages of children, but it actually goes to adults. And this is the group that we often worry about, you know, are going to be lazy or make bad decisions and that sort of thing. So we have to realize that we're already providing working age adults with a form of basic income. It's only partial. So we've also used the tax system increasingly to provide benefits to people directly. When child benefits started out, for example, most of the income portion was coming from the federal government and the provincial and territorial governments were supposed to be providing a range of services and income. Some of the services didn't work out so well and they actually put their money into a benefit as well. So most jurisdictions now top up that federal benefit. So we're increasingly using this, this form, this machinery for delivering income benefits. Um, so they're really, and we've got good experience with this, and they're politically supported across the board, these programs. So why not just go and do the rest of it? You know, just get 18 to 16 year olds on board, we can rationalize some things down the road, but get that gap filled in immediately. I can make just another quick comment on the word incremental, because I hear people using this and to me, they're using it incorrectly or in various ways. So if you look at incrementally training for a marathon example, if you, if you want to run 10K, you start training doing 2K and then four, and you work your way, you know exactly what the goal is. You know where you're headed. You know what it takes to get there. In some respects, child benefits were done that way. They knew what the amount was they needed, but they didn't get quite there at the beginning, and benefit, so they got the system in place and benefits ramped up. But when you look at it from another perspective, I think the, the sort of medical model makes sense. So this is the idea of if you have something like pneumonia and you don't take the proper dose, you don't give people enough, you're not going to make them better. And in Canada's situation, if you don't provide something that's going to get people well beyond social assistance, then you're supporting two competing systems with all of the expense and the harm that social assistance continues to provide. So in Canada, it's not going to be the same everywhere, but here we should just do it. Great. That's, that's a terrific example, Sheila. Thanks very much. Uh, Evelyn, I want to go back to you and, and the question I started asking about MINCOM. And so your, uh, your research, research uh, revealed extraordinary health and, and community benefits for those who participated in the Manitoba exper experiments. 
uh, in the late 1970s. And one of the most revealing aspects of basic income, and you talk about it in your book, Basic Income for Canadians, is that it affects genders differently and had a uniquely positive effect for women. Can you unpack that a little bit for us and, and uh, explain what you mean? Uh, sure. Let me, let me talk a little bit about that experiment and the results of that experiment in the first place. Um, in the 1970s, the federal government and the provincial government uh, partnered to run this pilot project in Manitoba in two cities, in Winnipeg and the town of Dauphin. Dauphin was a fairly small town, uh, about 10,000 people. It was agriculturally dependent, and about a third of the population had incomes low enough that they would qualify for the basic income that was under consideration. Now, this was set up in much the same way that the Canada Child Benefit is now set up. And in fact, the Child Benefit was modeled on the program that was that was put in place in 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 um, income. So if families had no income from any other source, they received uh, the agreed upon amount, which was just slightly more generous than um, provincial welfare at the time. As their income from other sources, and in particular from working, increased, the benefit declined, but it declined by 50 cents on the dollar. So it gradually um, disappeared as their income rose. Um, I, the purpose of that experiment was to find out if people worked less. That was the sole goal. Do people work less if you give them a basic income? And um, the findings that came out about 10 years after the experiment ended um, were that for most people, it had very little impact on working. Grown-ups with full-time jobs just continued to work. But there were two groups of people who worked significantly less. Um, one were new mothers. Now, if you think back to the 1970s, um, there was a rather miserly approach to um, maternity leave during the period. So new mothers at the time were only entitled to a four-week leave, and many of them decided that the income stipend would be a good way to, um, uh, to support a longer parental leave. So they effectively anticipated um, the social policies we've brought in since then, and they bought themselves longer mat leaves. But the other group of people who worked significantly less were young, unattached males. So about 10 years ago, a little slightly more than that, I went back to this project and I wanted to find out what the, what the effect of income was on quality of life. And I started by looking for some of those young, unattached males because I had a pretty fair idea of where I was going to find them. And um, it, it turned out that one of the consequences of the income experiment was that um, boys were more likely to finish high school when their parents received a basic income. And when I talked to participants in the experiment, I heard that um, young men, um, young boys, were under a fair amount of family pressure if they lived in low-income families to become self-supporting as quickly as they could so that the family money could go to support younger brothers and sisters. When income came along, some of those families encouraged their sons to stay in high school a little bit longer. Now, this sounds a little bit backwards. You asked me about women and about gender, but in fact, I think one of the things that Mincom showed us was that um, what, what Mincom did was to allow people to make their own decisions about gender roles. So the boys had the opportunity to finish high school. The girls had already had that opportunity because there weren't so many alternatives for them. There weren't so many high paying jobs out there that they could get in order to support themselves. But the boys had the opportunity to stay in school. Now, my big focus was on healthcare. I found out that people um, used hospitals less, they, um, uh, they went to family doctors less often, and mental health issues were a big concern. But um, women, addressing, addressing opportunities for women is, um, is um, one thing that Mincom did very well. And I just want to tell one story that one of the participants told me. When Mincom came along, she had been on provincial income assistance. She was a single mother of two young daughters, and she'd gone to her caseworker many times asking them to support her to take some job training so that she could support her kids. And she said she was treated very respectfully by the system. She was treated very compassionately, but the caseworker kept telling her to go home and take care of her kids, right? Go home and take care of her kids and we'll take care of you. When Mincom came along, she had the opportunity to withdraw from provincial income assistance to register for Mincom instead. And under Mincom, she had the opportunity to spend the money any way she wanted to. 
So she went to community college. She got some job training. She got a part-time job. And when I talked to her, she just retired from a long career as a district librarian. And she was incredibly proud of having modeled a different kind of a life for her children. So what income did was to give her the opportunity to question some of the gender roles that were um, implicit in the programs that we had in place in the 1970s. One of the things that our existing social programs do is to, um, to try to encourage people to behave in particular ways that we think are appropriate. And those attitudes do change over time and they change for different people. So she had the opportunity to spend the money and to live the kind of a life that she considered appropriate. Um, so I think one thing that basic income does, and I think it does it for all people, not just for women, it, it gives people the opportunity to do, as James said, to do the kind of work that they consider important. For some people, that's a participation in the paid labor market. For other people, it's involvement in creative work or in caring work or in other kinds of things. That was probably most apparent for women during the income period, just because women's lives are um, they were a little more varied than men's lives during the period. Men were focused on the labor market. They worked before men come came along and they continue to work after men come came along. Terrific. Th thanks, uh, thanks, Evelyn. And that's a terrific story as well. And it, it actually leads nicely into my last question, uh, which I'll pose to James. So James, you're a, you're a younger worker, a millennial. Uh, you used to work in the financial services sector as, as, uh, as we talked about. Um, and you're, experience in work is much different than previous generations. Uh, there's less stability. It's much more precarious. Uh, and as you've mentioned, you've uh, witnessed the onset of automation firsthand. So can you just talk to us for a couple minutes, and we want to get to questions fairly quickly, but uh, for a minute or two, um, how might basic income respond to this uh, growing shift in the way we work now? Yeah, I, I touched on this a little bit already, but it, it's going to respond to it by actually having something in place to make sure that people, once their jobs do disappear, um, if they're in an industry where that will happen, um, they have something. There's going to be something there to take care of them. I, because um, there's not going to be, literally, with an increasing population and the increasing level of techno technological advancement and one app being able to replace an entire job, um, there's all sorts of different sectors that are going to be affected. I know I only have a couple minutes here, but it's not just the banking industry where I was personally being replaced by a single application. It's also things like um, lawyers firms. They used to require teams of people to do uh, search for precedent in cases, and they used to have you know a bunch of students come in, entry-level jobs. It was a normal thing. But with one invention, something like IBM's Watson, Watson can now look through every book of law, search for case precedent in, in, in an instant, and you know has the critical thinking ability to to uh, find that for those people. They don't need that team of people anymore. They don't need those entry level jobs. They don't need those students coming out of university. There's a ton of students coming out of university right now. They were working at Starbucks and other you know low level jobs because there's just not work in their field in their industry and those entry level jobs. So those barriers to in, um, entering those fields aren't aren't there. Um, so it's going to respond to the shift by by allowing these people to really search for and consider, okay, you know, if it's not just about me trading my labor and my time for, for work, for a paycheck, for a job, what is it? What am I supposed to do here? How, how, how do I want to live my life? Uh, and, and having the financials and the basic needs and the roof over your head and, and the food, you know, in, in your refrigerator taken care of allows you the, the peace of mind to do that. I don't know if people remember, you know, the Industrial Revolution, the riots and things that occurred because of that, because people didn't have, you know, the, the means to take care of themselves. You know, the, the government has a responsibility. Our society has a responsibility to make sure that, you know, when these changes come, inevitably, uh, we have something in place to um, make sure that it can be a smooth transition and that we don't stifle automation. We don't stifle innovation just for the sake of, of paychecks and, and menial menial labor jobs so that people can can eat. We, we want to innovate. So it's also going to help us continue to innovate and make a technolo technological process that I think is necessary for our planet to keep going in a healthy direction. So 
Um, I can keep talking, but I know we have time. <laughs> and I'm sure there'll be some so. questions. Thank you very yeah. much, James. Um, as we all know, we have a, uh, an, uh, at least for those of us in Canada, we have a federal election coming up in October. And so our first question is from Kim. What kind of legislation could the federal government implement to move this forward? What political parties have taken a position in support of guaranteed livable income? And uh, so I'll throw that out to the panel, whoever wants to answer it. Sheila, do you want to go first? Sorry, can you repeat the question, Tom? I got a bit distracted here. Yeah, the, uh, the question was from Kim, and it was really asking what the federal government could do uh, to implement basic income, to move it forward, uh, but also what position our political parties, our federal political parties, have taken on basic income. You're right. This is a, a really interesting question and a really important time in history. We, the federal government started out the year in January, I think, with Minister Duflo actually making an announcement that they did intend to move in this direction. Um, we know that at least three of the parties have some form of, of policy position on basic income in their policy books, but it hasn't really translated into platforms yet. So that's something that I think we all have to work on and it's going to take a certain amount of just political pressure and just everybody who's supporting basic income to really get out there and make their voices heard during the election period. We attend all party meetings and just ask questions, like let people know that Canada really needs this and that our, you know, we hope our leaders really are going to lead. Great. Thanks, Sheila. Evelyn, James, any uh, any thoughts? I, I think um, one of the difficulties that we've seen happen over and over again, and it certainly happened in Ontario, is that the four-year change of governments hasn't been particularly um, fruitful to this kind of a big rethink of the way we deliver social programs. Um, Mincom ended because Mincom ran its full course as planned, but it was essentially shelved for 40 years, largely because um, political parties changed in the 1970s. We saw what happened in Ontario when the project didn't even get to the first um, to the first about first evaluation survey before it was cancelled. Um, I think it's difficult, um, given the way given the way we run um, our government, this first past the post government system. It's very difficult to bring about the large scale change that we've been talking about. We've seen movement toward basic income. We've seen it for a very long time in Canada. As Sheila mentioned, we, we've seen the, the evolution of the Canada Job Benefit. We've seen the implementation and the growth of the Guaranteed Income Supplement. But the, the great sticking point is really better benefits for working age people, people between 18 and 64. I'd love to see the Senate take um, take a very strong role in um, in helping whatever government ends up in power come October to think about the role that they might play in making it possible for this to happen. I think in an ideal world, we'd love to see provinces and the federal government working together to introduce a, a benefit. Um, but realistically, it's the federal government that's got the fiscal capacity to do this. So the federal government um, could work um, it really could work on its own um, towards introducing a basic income that would make life a lot easier for very many working age people. And I think that there are a lot of ways that they can be looking at doing that. Um, one of the things that many people have been um, focusing on is to rethink the way we deliver some of the non-refundable and refundable tax benefits that show up on our income tax forms every year. Um, it's a very complex system we've put in place. It takes a lot of time for people to figure out what it is that they're entitled to, but putting some of those benefits together into, into a larger kind of a return is something that you could easily build a basic income on over time. Great. Thanks, Evelyn. Uh, and, and that actually fits well into the next question from Fred. Um, he, he asked, with a path towards basic income, does it justify the cancellation of these programs? 
to give people slash families more freedom and reduce administrative overhead. Um, so maybe I could throw that out as well. Is there is does it make sense to have uh, have as Evelyn has suggested all of uh, all of the programs combined uh, into into one singular basic income for Canadians? Not all. <laughs> okay. Not all programs. That's not lots. I'm I'm suggesting that we, we yeah many many you know we have a guarantee um, that we have. Um, What's it called? The GST rebate, for example. We have the Canada Workers Benefit on our income tax, but but there are many many of those smaller um, smaller tax benefits that could be put together. Not all programs. Um, some programs we need to maintain in place, and particularly we need to look at the level of support that's coming to people. People have to receive enough money um, so that they're not worse off after the given change. Um, so, I mean, I, which programs you can replace depends on how quickly you move towards your particular goal. Sheila, did you want to jump in on this question? So, you know, Evelyn mentioned that Canada really does have a very complex tax system, and a lot of people just in general are saying we need to simplify. This is one of the best ways that we can really simplify in a very rational and effective way. We're leaking a lot of money to people who don't need it. So that's one of the areas that we can look at. Um, one of the things that the Basic Income Canada Network is working on is a, a modeling exercise to look at, you know, where, where do we find the things that can be rolled in? And because our system is so complex, it's, it's not as easy as, as you might imagine, but the resources are there. We, we can fund this and, you know, we can look at all sorts of things within the tax and transfer system. You don't have to think about cancelling programs so much as holding in the ones that all do the same thing, providing direct cash, and then look at what's left and what you need, and gradually over time, you'll get a better sense of other kinds of things that are truly needed, that aren't just compensating for people's lack of income. So I think our system can work much better. Great. Thanks, Sheila. And um, if, if there are other questions, uh, please let us know. Raise your digital hand, and uh, we will certainly try to get to them in the next eight minutes. Um, but I wanted to ask James, uh, because he has obviously the most personal and direct experience on a pilot project um, uh, with the cancellation of the Ontario pilot. Uh, almost a year ago, uh, it was announced, and, and uh, participants received their final basic income. Uh, checks uh, in, in March of this year. But uh, James, what are your, your feelings on doing more pilots or encouraging the government uh, to really go, go full out and implement basic income? Do you have any thoughts on that as a, as a former participant? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't believe we, we need more pilots. I think the data is pretty clear already. Unfortunately, we weren't able to collect the data uh, as comprehensively as the original survey uh, was given to, to all of the pilot participants before this uh, you, the pilot was rolled out, we never got to follow up. The, federal, or the provincial government didn't allow us the opportunity to follow up and, and give the data. But from the reports, from the anecdotal evidence, from speaking to the participants, we see what happened. It's pretty clear. And from the MINCOM experiment in, in Manitoba, we've, we've seen it. It's pretty clear. Um, and now I think you know, I know we're talking Canadian politics, but if you go to U.S. politics, that's on the world stage right now. One of the main Democratic candidates uh, is talking about, um, he calls it the freedom dividend. Um, and that's something that's going to be front row center being talked about. Um, and there's a lot of economists. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of people saying, yeah, this, this would work. When you give money to people, where does it go anyways? It goes right back into the economy. They're going to spend it in the economy. So, yeah, sure, it's going to cost this, this amount of money. In the States, it's however many trillion dollars. In Canada, we're, we're only the size of California in terms of population. We can most definitely afford it. And that's something that's only going to stimulate, I think, the economy. And, you know, I... I might have an economics degree. I'm no expert, but go listen to the experts. You know, they, they it's pretty clear. This is something that uh, can absolutely work. And I think the federal government, like uh, uh, 
Dr. Evelyn was just saying, this is something that the federal government has the means and the ability to to roll out. Uh, I don't think this is uh, needs to be a, a provincial pilot, you know, uh, test. We've already done a couple tests, and because of that four-year period of uh, you know different governments coming in and canceling this because you know the new guys in power doing another pilot, you know, that might happen again. We don't. It's not necessary. Um, and I, I think um, the, the data is clear. There's tons of people you can list to, listen to if you want more information on it. Um, it's just about doing the Great. homework and, and taking a deep look at, at what's already been Thanks, established. James. Thank you, James. And there's one remaining question here I, I wanted to put on the table, and it's it's been addressed a little bit, um, but maybe uh, maybe for Sheila. Has, has anyone calculated the cost savings if uh, basic income guarantee replaced other income supports? across Canada. Um, you've talked about it being affordable, but um, ha has there been any uh, numbers crunched on, on how much it might actually save? So that's something that's really hard to do. I mean, Evelyn has an example from savings in health care costs. Um, there have also been I mean, quite a number of studies done by the Ontario Association of Food Banks, I think, looking at various costs of poverty um, in terms of, you know, lost productivity, in terms of health care, time, all of those things. Um, those are kind of difficult to add up to the satisfaction of somebody sitting around a cabinet table, you know, having to, you know, put a number on the table to, to argue for this. Um, there's also the fact that like we really don't know exactly what might happen down the road like once we if we have a mature basic income as James said it's going to open up a lot of creativity people are going to start doing different things they're going to start needing different things um, people being happier and healthier is going to change a lot um, but I guess my my bottom line answer to this comes from being a federal public servant for almost 30 years working in policy and you come to the realization that you are never going to get perfect you're not going to get perfect information another pilot is not going to give us any more information that's going to answer all the questions for everybody but you get to the point where it's enough and you have to do something because the alternative is much worse and I really think we're there. Thanks, Sheila. And Evelyn, last 30 seconds to you. I think you'd probably agree that we've had, had our fill of pilots and, and we need to move forward.